<laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to tell you about how we went from uh, starting a bug bounty program at Ovo Energy and how that then led to uh, about a year or so later creating an OWASP, new OWASP project. And what this tool does is it helps to protect against subdomain takeover. So I'm going to start just by um, explaining what subdomain takeover is. Now, some of you will know all about what it is, but some of you won't. So I'm just going to uh, explain what it means. So if you imagine um, an engineer builds an S3 bucket in Amazon Web Services, and then they want to point a uh, DNS record uh, to that. So they create a entry, DNS entry in route 53, and that points to that S3 bucket. And then somebody can go to that address and see some static content and see a website. So that's all well and good, and that all works wonderfully. But then what happens, or what can happen, maybe a year later, somebody tidies up an AWS account and looks at this and says, oh, we've got an S3 bucket here. We don't need that anymore. We have that website. Doesn't, nobody uses that website anymore. So they just delete the S3 bucket. But what the engineer who does that, which might be a different engineer, of course, because the first person might have left the company, um, what happens then is, um, or what can happen then, is they don't realize or forget that they also have to remove the DNS entry. So now you've got a DNS entry um, which is known also as a dangling DNS entry because it points to something that doesn't exist. And when that's a problem is when that thing, resource that it points to is a cloud resource um, and a particular type of cloud resource that somebody else can just recreate. Um, so an attacker can recreate that S3 bucket themselves. And then they have now taken over a um, you know a website that is a, is an official company um, name, you know, and can then use that for all sorts of damaging purposes to um, uh, you know trash a reputation of an organization by posting uh, malicious content. Um, or um, is the mic still working? Okay, great. Thanks. You just turned it down. Um, or by um, uh, you know, hosting a site to harvest credentials um, and you know, get phishing attacks to point to it. So that can be very damaging. So that's what subdomain, that's an example of subdomain takeover. There are lots of different sorts. I just picked the S3 bucket because it's a simple one, but there are lots of different types of subdomain takeover, but that's, they're all basically that sort of principle. Um, and that can actually be quite a big problem for companies, um, depending on the company and how they work and how big it is. So what we're going to do next, or what I'm going to do next, is create some deliberately vulnerable domains. And you'll see why um, I'm doing this a little bit later on. So I've got a little cheat sheet here so that I know what I'm doing. Um, and uh, I'm going to go into uh, Amazon Web Services. Uh, and I'm um, going to go to Route 53. So Route 53 is Amazon Web Services. Uh, um, uh, DNS sort of platform. Um, so you can use Route 53 to actually register a domain, you know, mycompany.com. You want to register it like as if you were, you know, like with going to GoDaddy. You don't have to do it there. You could do that somewhere else. And then the other part of Route 53, which is the one I'm focusing mainly on here, is uh, actually where all the records are kept. So I've got four hosted zones that I've created here. And these are just hosted zones for you know, my own company, which is called Celador. Um, and uh, one of the domain names which I've registered is Celador.io. So I've registered this domain. So what I'm now going to do is to create a few um, vulnerable records. So the first one I'm going to create is, um, and, and I'm using the theme of planets. So I'm going to create a record. Uh, so this is a new record. So I'm going to call this one Mercury. So this is mercury.celador.io. And I'm going to make it a C name. So C name is canonical name. So that's when one DNS entry points to uh, another one. And that's a commonly used uh, sort of method of um, uh, for DNS. Um, and I'm going to point this to this, uh, this um, value. 
uh, which is the value of, a, uh, of an S3 bucket, which doesn't exist. Uh, so this simulates, so I've just created a record. So what this simulates is what I just showed on the, on the slide a minute ago. This simulates somebody creating an S3 bucket, pointing to it with a DNS record, and then deleting the S3 bucket, but leaving the DNS record there. I just didn't want to go through all those steps, so I just went straight to the, the end goal. But that's, that's what I've, I've just simulated. So that's one record. Um, now, the next one I'm going to do is um, an A record. So an A record is where you create a record that just points to an IP address, IP version 4 address. Um, and I'm going to point this to uh, an A record. So I'm going to choose this address. So this is an address which I happen to know is an Amazon Web Services uh, address, which um, uh, I'm going to create. However, it's one that isn't actually in any of my accounts. So this simulates something, this simulates a um, somebody creating a virtual machine. So an EC2 instance, for example, or an elastic IP address, which is a fixed IP address, um, and then creating a DNS record that points to it, and then deleting the virtual machine or um, uh, deleting that elastic IP address and then somebody else potentially taking it over. So that's what that simulates. So that's a vulnerable A record. Um, so I've done that one. And the next one I'm going to do is, um, yes. So uh, another type of record which you can get is where you want to, um, so, so here I've got a host, host zone called Celador.io. What I now want to do is I'm now going to create, well, I've already created a subdomain. So the subdomain is pluto.celador.io. So that's um, another host of So this is a common thing that is often done in companies. You might have um, a production environment, and then you might want to create a separate dev.myapp.company.com uh, as a separate uh, host of zone that might be in a different AWS account. So um, I've created this second, um, this, this subdomain. So I already have created this subdomain. And when I created that, Amazon uh, Web Services provided four name servers, which look after this. Um, and then what I then had to do to actually make that work is I had to delegate um, to that subdomain from the top level domain. So I then put in a record, which I did, um, uh, I've already done. So in here, I've already I've got a record which is um, pluto.salador.io, and that then points to those four name servers which Amazon um, assigns. So, so it all works. So that's all fine. But what can happen is that um, again somebody can be tidying up an AWS account and saying, "Well, that project's gone now. We don't need this project anymore. Uh, this hosted zone costs whatever it costs a month." $1.50 a month or something. Uh, so I'm just going to delete it. I don't need it anymore. So I'm going to delete that, making sure I delete the right one. <laughs> don't want to delete the wrong one. Uh, here we go. So I'm just deleting that host and zone. So now I've deleted that zone. But what I've forgotten to do is to delete the record that pointed to it. So again, potentially that could be an issue because somebody could take over the, uh, the hosted zone in their own account and, and do that in such a way um, in a brute force way until they got the same name servers or some of the names, uh, same name servers. Okay, so these examples so far have been AWS. So I'm just going to do one more. And the next one I'm going to do is actually on Cloudflare. So Cloudflare is a um, uh, content delivery network platform, uh, but you can also use it for DNS records. And um, I've got a hosted uh, a, a DNS um, zone in here. So uh, if I go to DNS, I'm going to create a new record. Um, and this is also going to be a um, C name. And this is going to be Neptune. And this one will point to um, an Elastic Beanstalk instance. So an el Elastic Beanstalk is an 
Amazon Web Services service that allows you to upload an app, upload some code, um, say what configuration you want to use, and then it just deploys everything for you. So it's one of those sort of a bit like app service or something in uh, Google um, or um, app, app engine in app engine in Google, app service in uh, Azure. Um, so, uh, so I'm pointing to that. Um, so that's uh, that's what I'm doing there. So I've created now four vulnerable domains. So we'll just leave those for now. And uh, what we'll do now is uh, go back to the presentation. So where was I? <laughs> you know all about subdomain takeover and what it is. What I'm going to talk about now is um, the OVO Energy Bug Bounty Program. So I did notice that one of the many, many companies that was on uh, Mark's uh, slide with a thousand companies on was actually Bug Crowd. Um, and they are a company, a bit like HackerOne, who provide a way of um, uh, uh, researchers um, uh, trying to uh, get find vulnerabilities in um, companies who want to use their services. Are any of you here members of Bug Crowd or use? Oh, you're not saying if you are. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm, um, there's some very good, very good researchers on Bug Crowd. Um, so anybody can sign up to Bug Crowd. I don't think I'm pretty sure Hacker One is the same. Anybody can sign up, and then you can just have a go at legitimately at hack, trying to hack um, certain targets of certain companies. Um, obviously, following you know all the, the rules and so on. And then if you find something, then you get rewarded. So um, you know, so for instance, uh, over energy, we pay out anything from like hundred dollars, or maybe more actually now, maybe one hundred fifty dollars, two hundred dollars, I think, to about three thousand dollars, depending on how how severe the the issue is. Um, and and we found it to be really useful uh, because um, the bug bounty researchers have found things that in some cases we didn't even know about. Um, it, it's been really really positive at, at uh, identifying issues. Um, and the, this is sort of what we paid out roughly over the uh, first, um, roughly over the first, well, bit over a year. So we started off um, uh, about a year and, a, year and nine months ago, around March, end of March. So, so to start off with, we, we, we just tip, dip, dipped our toe in the water as it were, and we just had one single domain that was in scope, because you can say what which domains you want in scope. Um, as we did that, uh, and then just got a few results from that, and that wasn't a full quarter anyway. Um, and then uh, we carried on, and then in the uh, this third quarter, we um, added a whole load of, we had all, nearly all, virtually all of our domains in, in scope. So then we got loads and loads of issues. <laughs> And then gradually since then, things have sort of stabilized. And I think we've, well, I would like to think we've improved our security and, uh, um, you know, we've got rid of a lot of those uh, sort of low-hanging fruit. So it's, it's been very successful. Um, and we've had a whole range of issues reported. Um, however, um, what we very quickly noticed, particularly in the first six months, is that about 50% of the issues that were found by the researchers and about 50% of the money that we paid out was all subdomain takeover issues. So we had a lot of subdomain takeover issues. So that then led us to think, well, you know, we, we can't just let this keep happening. We've got to do something about it. And um, uh, what we then decided to do was to, well, we had a look around to see what commercial tools there were um, available and also what, um, we didn't really find anything that, that we, we felt was right for us and uh, what open source tools there were. And uh, 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 what we found was that there was, most of the open source tools were really about helping um, bug bounty researchers. Uh, there weren't, wasn't really anything on the defensive side. So, um, so we decided to uh, create our own. Um, which we did. And from the beginning, we intended um, to make this open source. And, and we did make it, we did open source it fairly soon after we um, uh, created it. Um, since then, we've gradually added more features, had more collaborators. Um, and then thanks to Sam's um, suggestion and uh, persuasion, <laughs> well, gentle persuasion, um, uh, thanks to that, um, he, uh, we, 
it is now an OWASP project and has been for a couple of months. Uh, when I went, I took it through the, the process um, of uh, uh, making it become an OWASP project. And uh, the uh, senior management over energy were keen to do that as well because they wanted to, they saw the value of uh, the open source community and wanted to support that. Um, uh, so so that it was you know really banging on an open door with, with them. Um, uh, so we now have four OWASP repos, um, and they're all in the github.com forward slash domain protect. Uh, the, uh, the, the main one, which is for AWS and Cloudflare, is called domain protect. So do have a look. If you like the talk, give it a star, uh, please, <laughs> on the GitHub repository, um, uh, or if you think it's any good. Uh, we have a similar one for GCP, and then we've got a couple more which are um, straightforward ways to uh, deploy the, uh, the, the the domain protect um, uh, infrastructure using GitHub Actions. Uh, so that's that's what we have. So um, let me tell you a bit more about it. So what uh, what um, uh, domain protection actually does is because this is sort of defensive. And because all of our domain name records are um, actually held within the cloud, so they're all within AWS or GCP or Cloudflare, um, or in some a few cases Azure, uh, we actually can we can uh, um, log in, in fact, programmatically log in to AWS, find out what all the domain name uh, records are, and then we can test them all to, uh, to see if they're vulnerable or not. So that's sort of a bit different from what a bug bounty researcher does because they don't know what the DNS records are. So they've got to um, set up discovery programs to guess lots of different combinations and discover them all. And they're actually very good at doing that as well. But they, you know, but we are we do have an advantage because we control the, the DNS records. So, you know, the principle here was to create some infrastructure which could protect um, our organization um, and, and do it in such a way that any company or organization that wants to take advantage of this can do so. Um, so, uh, and we also want to make it low maintenance and um, uh, um, low cost. So the approach that we adopted was to use uh, completely, uh, to make it all completely serverless. So we use serverless functions, um, we use serverless database, DynamoDB, um, and you know, other serverless components. So there's no virtual machines running in the cloud or anything like that. Um, so it is very low cost to operate. So uh, the way that it works is um, uh, that, well, first of all, what we want to do is to scan the whole organization. So in, you know, if you just create your own, so how many of you have your own AWS account? So quite a few of you. Okay, so when you have your own AWS account, at least when you start off, you just have one. You just have one AWS account and you pay for the credit card. Uh, but then when you get bigger or when you set up a company, you don't just have one, you have hundreds or you know thousands in some case, because you, you're going to have different AWS accounts for different uh, projects in the company, different departments, you're going to have different ones for de development and tests and staging and production. And that's actually a good thing because you have then got good separation of um, uh, sort of access control according to which account you're in. So. Big organizations like OVO have you know, hundreds of AWS accounts, and uh, um, they are then um, the, the way to control of all of those is through uh, an AWS organization. GCP has and Azure has the similar concept. So, um, and, and AWS's recommended, recommended uh, approach is to have within that whole organization to of, of hundreds of accounts to have one account that is dedicated to security tooling. And that is where um, you, you should uh, put domain protect. So you install it within, well, I've called it the security audit account, but you install it within the security audit account. That then assumes a role into the organization management account. And that's where we, you can then find out what all of the different AWS accounts are in the organization. So we then, that Lambda function, which is a serverless function, gets back a complete list of all the AWS accounts. Um, and then, um, 
That then triggers a step function. So step function is an AWS service, which allows you to orchestrate uh, multiple Lambda functions, um, serverless functions. Um, and then that then triggers a Lambda function for every single AWS account in the organization, which in every case is about 400. Um, so, uh, and then the each function then assumes a role into that account, queries route 53, runs through all the DNS records, does some checks to see if they're vulnerable or not. And then if they are, it writes the record into the database, publishes to a um, simple notification service topic, and then uh, sends off another Lambda function, sends off Slack messages. So, and also allows an email subscription. So that's how the whole thing, sort of the architecture of the whole thing, how it all works. Um, so you can receive alerts by Slack or by email. So here's some examples of a newly discovered alert, an, an alert for a newly discovered um, vulnerable uh, subdomain. And you'll see here, actually, we have a, this little um, thing here saying bug crowd issue created. So we've got optional integrations with, with bug crowd so that if we find an issue, then uh, we can actually create a known issue in bug crowd. So that then if a researcher finds the same issue, we can legitimately say it was a duplicate issue. Um, we also get notified when something is fixed. Um, and we also get um, daily reports on the things that still need to be fixed but haven't yet been fixed. Um, and then once a month, we get stats of what it's found that month and that year and all time. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can manually scan from your laptop. So that can be useful for companies or organizations who think, well, we might have a problem, but I'm not sure. But I don't want to go, I don't want to actually, you know, go through the trouble of installing it. I just want to see if there might be a problem. And this you can manually scan from your laptop. There are some limitations to that because um, you just do one account at a time. And that could also be useful for penetration testers because they're normally not allowed to install stuff like Lambda function, functions, but they can run tools like this, and they're normally given the credentials to run those tools. So um, the, uh, when I, at the beginning, I would mention there's a lots of different types of subdomain takeover, and OWASP Domain Protect supports um, DNS records in AWS, Cloudflare, Google Cloud Platform, Cloud DNS, and um, resources across AWS, Cloudflare, um, well, sorry, AWS, Google Cloud, and Azure. Um, can look at registered domains, the name server delegation, um, alias and C names pointing to Elastic Beanstalk and S3 buckets, um, CloudFront distributions with missing S3 origins, and various Azure and Google Cloud resources, um, and then A records as well. So, um, and all of these were, or nearly all of these, uh, were actual issues that where, where bug bounty researchers found something and were paid out. And so then we wrote the code to um, detect it. So these aren't just theoretical things that, you know, we sort of thought, well, maybe, we, you know, this might be useful. These are actual things that bug bounty researchers did. And then now we've stopped them or, or detected them. So we did all that. But um, initially, when this was set up, uh, Domain Protect just ran once a day, and we had a manual approach of informing teams. And sometimes it took several days to actually for the teams to fix it. And what we found was the bug bounty researchers were a bit quicker than we were. So um, sometimes they took them over themselves before they were fixed, and sometimes even before we even found out about it, because we were only running once a day. So it was a bit of an arms race. So we had to sort of uh, re-architect the system to um, uh, speed it to, to, to monitor much more quickly. Um, and the other thing that we introduced was to actually, where it was straightforward to do so, to actually take over, do a friendly takeover ourselves. Um, so, uh, you know, the idea being here that if we if we take it over, you know, then um, we've got that resource, whether it's an S3 bucket or whatever, and then the attacker can't uh, the researcher or attacker can't take it over themselves, and we'll do it more quickly than the team will do it. We'll sort out the problem, so and, and it's automated. So 
we introduced that as well um, for elastic beanstalk and S3 buckets. Um, and then we uh, set up a way to deploy the whole um, infrastructure with GitHub Actions. So it's very straightforward to deploy without having to create a separate fork of the repo um, or even to clone the repo um, uh, for the code. So that's all uses GitHub Actions. Um, so the results in the first year were that um, we had about 200 vulnerable domains um, and about oh, half of those were detected um, and then takeover prevented by um, it, it, uh, Domain Protect in AWS. About 25 or so in GCP. We don't have as much infra infrastructure in GCP. Um, and about a, the, the rest was bug crowd and some manual scans, which we did before we developed Domain Protect. So, uh, so that's the result. And then since then, it's just carried on. <laughs> so, um, so we do have, so we do have, still have one or two. There's one bug bounty researcher that is still managing to do something we haven't haven't yet uh, yet covered with domain protect. But um, on the whole, with it's much much less of a problem than it ever was. So that's how what's domain protect. Uh, well, before I go to the, ne the next steps, let me now just give you a demo of some of that. So. Um, Let's, so I created those uh, deliberately vulnerable subdomains at the beginning of the talk. So let's see if they were what, let's see if they were detected or what happened. This is always the, this is always the bit that I never know what's going to happen <laughs> with the live demos. Right. Well, something has happened. So um, okay. So you'll see from the time there. The so the first this is a Slack channel. So the first um, thing that happened was the mercury.cellular.io was detected. Um, so that's the S3 bucket. Um, so uh, I'm just going to, just to make it a bit clearer, uh, because of the way Slack works, I'm just going to do an arbitrary reply to this. Um, OK, so OK, so, so, we, so first of all, we had the, the alert that there was a vulnerable um, domain called Mercury. Then we actually had an S3 bucket created um, to protect that. So that's why I was talking about the active, active protection uh, by actively taking, doing a friendly takeover. So let's see if that actually works. If I click on that link, um, yeah, so there it is. So this is what we're looking at here is we've actually gone to that domain, which has then taken us to that S3 bucket, which we've just taken over during the talk while I was talking. So that worked. That's good. Let's carry on. <laughs> See if the rest of it worked. Um, okay. So that was the that was the takeover. Um, so I'll just reply to that one as well. Okay. Uh, so then it discovered the Cloudflare Elastic Beanstalk one. Okay. So it discovered discovered that one. That was the one in Cloudflare. Um, what happened next? Then it discovered that the because that domain was taken over, we took it over ourselves with an S3 bucket. So that means it's actually not vulnerable anymore. I mean, it's still an issue, but we have taken it over. So that's why we've got a green tick and it says vulnerable domains fixed or taken over. So that it did detect that that was taken over. So that's good. What else do we have? Then we had the vulnerable name server one. So I'm just the only reason I'm doing this reply is so that you can see the icon, so it's a bit clearer uh, because of the way Slack works. So, so then, uh, yeah. So then we had the name server delegation. So that's the one where we were delegating from a top level domain to a subdomain, and I deleted uh, deleted the hosted zone that was being delegated to, but I forgot to delete the record that was pointing to it. So, um, so it detected that. So that was good. Um, and what happened next? So then the Elastic Beanstalk environment was created. That's good. Um, yeah, so the Elastic Beanstalk instance was created. 
So again, if we go to this, that's now taking us to the Elastic Beanstalk the, um, instance that was created. Now, every demo, every live demo, somebody was telling me earlier, always goes wrong. And this has gone slightly wrong because for some reason, which I'll have to investigate, um, the A record one hasn't come through. Um, and I think I know, <laughs> I think I know, I think I know why that probably is, because uh, I probably set some, I might not have turned that feature on, but I'm not sure. I'll have to look into that. But anyway, it normally works, <laughs> honest. But the rest of it all worked anyway. So um, yeah, so that's that's the demo. Right, so now let's, but let's have a look at a couple of those things within the AWS account. Um, so if I now go into the AWS account where everything is, where, so, where the, so this is the security tooling account. So we just go into there and we go into step functions. Um, uh, this is... This is this, this so so at the moment it's you can see that it's actually I've set it to run every five minutes. Um, that's all adjustable and it's all deployed through Terraform, so you can adjust all of these things. Um, and yeah, you can see that it's being running every five minutes, and these are all of the different uh, lambda functions that are being invoked. Um, and then if we go to uh, DynamoDB. We'll see the uh, the table that actually lists all of the vulnerabilities. So that's the this is the Dynamo DB table. So we could explore. You're not supposed to do scans too often, but oh, here they, here they are. Yeah, so. These are some of the different records in the in the Dynamo DB uh, database. Okay, um, right. So I think you've got the idea what it all, what it all does. Um, it's now an OWASP project. So what are the next steps? Well, the next steps. Well, I'm, I'm very interested to hear about any organisations using it and what they actually want to see that isn't in there already. Um, we do have. I'm aware of a lot, a lot of organisations who are using it, including some quite, um, you know, well-known household names, which is very, you know, pleasing. Um, so it's been quite well used. Um, would like to do more automated tests. We've got some test coverage, but as with a lot of code, not enough test coverage. Um, we'd like to. Uh, so we have had requests for an A record check for GCP in a similar way to AWS. Um, that's definitely needs doing, uh, and, and we've had a couple of takeovers because that feature isn't in place. <laughs> so that that's a feature that needs doing. Um, we're not currently currently not covering Azure DNS, so we're very interested if there is a company or organisation that wanted to implement this in Azure, and really anything else that anybody is um, sees as a need uh, need for this. And um, collaborators are you know very welcome particularly now it's they were always welcome but even more so now it's no one's project uh, also looking for other project leaders at the moment i'm the only project leader and i'm a bit lonely so yes uh, we're looking for other project leaders as well um, and and collaborators would be fantastic um i'll also be giving a talk uh as will sam actually at um on the He's been very modest when he was talking about global appsec uh dublin because sam is actually giving a talk on nataka the project for which he's a project leader um, and I'm talking on this as well so um, hopefully you know we'll we'll meet some more potential collaborators uh, there as well so if you are interested in collaborating uh, the uh, we do have a, um, a channel in uh, as do all OWASP projects within the OWASP Slack um, and you can also contact me directly I was flat. That's probably going to be the most straightforward way to communicate with me. Sam explained how straightforward it was to get on to that platform. Um, uh, and that's both whether you're a member or not, I think. Yeah, you can still join that. So that's good. Uh, you also free, feel free to contact me on LinkedIn. And I do tweet sometimes <laughs> as well. Right. So thank you very much. Excellent.